Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Asia, and I'm back with another reading video. I'm very sorry I haven't uploaded anything in a long time. Third quarter is very stressful and has, it's, it's very content heavy, but um, hopefully I'll be able to get more chapters to you more often since spring break is coming around. But uh, without further ado, let's start with chapter nine, the founding of Narnia. The lion was pacing to and fro about that empty land and singing his new song. It was softer and more lilting than the song by which he had called up the stars and the sun, a gentle rippling music. And as he walked and sang, the valley grew green with grass. It spread out from the lion like a pool. It ran up the sides of the little hills like a wave. In a few minutes, it was creeping up the lower slopes of the distant mountains, making that young world every moment softer. The light wind could now be heard ruffling the grass. Soon there were other things besides grass. The higher slopes grew dark with heather. Patches of rougher and more bristling green appeared in the valley. Diggory did not know what they were until one began coming up quite close to him. It was a little spiky thing that threw out dozens of arms and covered these arms with green and grew larger at the rate of about an inch every two seconds. There were dozens of these things all around him now. When they were nearly as tall as himself, he saw what they were. Trees, he exclaimed. The nuisance of it, as Polly said afterward, was that you weren't left in peace to watch it all. Just as Diggory said trees, he had to jump because Uncle Andrew had sidled up to him again and was just going to pick his pocket. It wouldn't have done Uncle Andrew much good if he had succeeded, for he was aiming at the right hand pocket because he still had because he still thought the green rings were homeward rings. But of course Diggory didn't want to lose either. Stop, cried the witch. Stand back, no further back. If anyone goes within ten paces of either of the children, I will knock out his brains. She was poising in her hand the iron bar that she had torn off the lamppost, ready to throw it. Somehow, no one doubted that she would be a very good shot. So, she said, you would steal back to your own world with the boy and leave me here. Uncle Andrew's temper at last got the better of his fears. Yes, ma'am, I would, he said. Most undoubtedly, I would. I should be perfectly in my rights. I have been most shamefully, most abominably treated. I have done my best to show you such civ civilities as were in my power. And what has been my reward? You have robbed, I must repeat the word, robbed, a highly respectable jeweler. You have insisted on my entertaining you to an exceedingly expensive, not to say ostentatious, lunch, though I was obliged to pawn my watch and chain in order to do so. And let me tell you, ma'am, that none of our family have been in the habit of quenching pawn, pawn shops except my cousin Edward, and he was in the yeomanry. Ye don't know what that is. During that indigestible meal, I'm feeling the worse for it at this very moment. Your behavior and conversation attracted the unfavorable attention of everyone present. I feel I have been publicly disgraced. I shall never be able to show my face in that restaurant again. You have assaulted the police. You have stolen- Oh, stow it, governor. Do stow it, said the cabbie, watching and listens the thing at present, not talking. There is pl cer certainly plenty to watch and to listen to. The tree which Diggory had noticed was now a gr full green, full ground beech whose branches swayed gently above his head. They stood on cool green grass sprinkled with daisies and buttercups. A little way off along the river bank, willows were growing. On the other side, triangles of flowering currant, lilac, wild rose, and ro rhododendron closed in them in. I think that's how you pronounce it. The horse was tearing up delicious mouthfuls of new grass. All this time, the lion's song and, and his stately prowl to and fro backward and forward was going on. What was rather alarming was that at each turn he came a little nearer. Polly was finding the song more and more interesting because she thought she was beginning to see the connection between the music and the things that were happening. When a, like of dark fur, when a line of dark furs sprang up on a ridge about a hundred yards away, she felt that they were connected with a series of deep, prolonged notes which the lion had sung a second before. And when he burst into a rapid series of lighter notes, she was not surprised to see primroses suddenly appearing in every direction. Thus, with an unspeakable thrill, she felt quite certain that all the things were coming, as she said, out of the lion's head. When you listened to this song, you heard the things he was making up. When you looked around you, you saw them. This was so exciting that she had no time to be afraid. But Diggory and the cabbie could not help feeling a bit nervous as each turn of the lion's walk brought him nearer. 
As for Uncle Andrew, his teeth were chattering, but his knees were shaking so that he could not run away. Alright, there's a picture here, so I'll let you look at that. Alright, we are going to continue. Suddenly, the witch stepped boldly out toward the lion. It was coming on, always singing with a slow, heavy pace. It was only 12 yards away. She raised her arm and flung the iron bar straight at its head. Nobody, least of all Jadis, could have missed at that range. The bar struck the lion fair between the eyes. It glanced off and fell with a thud in the grass. The lion came on. Its walk was neither slower nor faster than before. You could not tell whether it even knew it had been hit. Though its soft pads made no noise, you could feel the earth shake beneath their weight. The witch shrieked and ran. In a few moments, she was out of sight among the trees. Uncle Andrew turned to do likewise, tripped over a root, and fell flat on his face in a little brook that, that ran down to join the river. The children could not move. They were not even quite sure what that they wanted to. The lion paid no attention to them. Its huge red mouth was open, but open in song, not in a snarl. It passed by them so close that they could have touched its mane. They were terribly afraid it would turn and look at them, yet in some queer way they wished it would. But for all the notice it took of them, they might just as well have been invisible and unsmellable. When it had passed them and gone a few paces further, it turned, passed them again, and continued its march eastward. Uncle Andrew, coughing and spluttering, picked himself up. Now, Diggory, he said, we've got rid of that woman, and the brute of a lion is gone. Give me your hand and put on your ring at once. Keep off, said Diggory, backing away from him. Keep clear of him, Polly. Come over here beside me. Now, I warn you, Uncle Andrew, don't come one step nearer. You'll, we'll just vanish. Do what you're told this minute, sir, said Uncle Andrew. You're an extremely disobedient, ill-behaved little boy. No fear, said Diggory. We want to stay and see what happens. I thought you wanted to know about other worlds. Don't you like it now you're here? Like it, exclaimed Uncle Andrew. Just look at the state I'm in. And it was best my and it was my best coat and waistcoat, too. He certainly was a dreadful sight by now, for of course the more dressed up you were to begin with, the worse you looked after you crawled out of a smashed handsome cab and fallen into a muddy brook. I'm not saying, he added, that this is not a most interesting place. If I were a younger man now, perhaps I could get some lively young fellow to come here first. One of those big game hunters. Something might be made of this country. The climate is delightful. I never felt such air. I believe it would have done me good if if circumstances would have been more favorable. If we'd only had a gun. Guns be blowed, said the cabbie. I think I'll go and see if I can give Strawberry a rub down. That horse has more sense than some humans, as I could mention. He walked back to Strawberry and began making the hissing noises that grooms make. Do you still think that lion could be killed by a gun? asked Diggory. He didn't mind the iron bar much. With all her faults, said Uncle Andrew, that's a plucky gel, my boy. It was a spirited thing to do. He rubbed his hands and cracked his knuckles, as if he were once more forgetting how the witch frightened him whenever she was really there. It was a wicked thing to do, said Polly. What harm had he done to her? Hello, what's that? said Diggory. He had darted forward to examine something only a few yards away. I say, Polly, he called back, do come and look. Uncle Andrew came with her, not because he wanted to see, but because he wanted to keep close to the children. There might be a chance of stealing their rings. But when he saw what Diggory was looking at, even he began to take an interest. It was a perfect little model of a lamppost, just about three feet high, but lengthening and thickening in proportion as they watched it, in fact, just grow in fact, growing just as the trees had grown. It's alive, too. I mean, it's lit, said Diggory. And so it was, though, of course, the brightness of the sun made the little flame in the lantern hard to see unless your shadow fell on it. Remarkable, most mar remarkable, muttered a Uncle Andrew. I ne even I never dreamed of magic like this. We're in a world where everything... Even a lamppost comes to life and grows. Now I wonder what sort of seed a lamppost grows from. Don't you see, said Diggory, this is where the bar fell. The bar she tore off of the lamppost at home. It sank into the ground, and now it's coming up as a young lamppost. But not so very young now. It was as tall as Diggory Wally said this. That's it. Stupendous, stupendous, said Uncle Andrew, rubbing his hands harder than ever. Ho, ho. They laughed at my magic. That fool of a sister of mine thinks I'm a lunatic. I wonder what they'll say now. I have discovered a world where everything is bursting with life and growth. Columbus now, they talk about Columbus. But what was America to this? The commercial possibilities of this country are unbounded. Bring a few old bits of scrap iron here, bury them, and up they come as brand new railway engines, battleships, anything you please. They'll cost nothing, and I can sell them at full prices in England. I shall be a millionaire. And then the climate. I feel years younger already. I, I feel years younger already. I can run it at a health resort. 
A good sanatorium here might be worth 20,000 a year. Of course, I shall, I shall have to let a few people into the secret. The first thing is to get that brute shot. You're just like the witch, said Polly. All you think of is killing things. And then, as regards oneself, Uncle Andrew continued in a happy dream, there's no knowing how long I might live if I settled here. And that's a big consideration when a fellow had just turned 60. I shouldn't be surprised if I never grew a day old in this country. Stupendous! The land of youth! Oh, cried Diggory, the land of youth? Do you really think it is? For of course he remembered what Aunt Letty had said to the lady who brought the grapes, and that sweet hope rushed back upon him. Uncle Andrew, he said, do you think there's anything here that would cure mother? What are you talking about, said Uncle Andrew. This isn't a chemist's shop. But as I was saying, you don't care two pence about her, said Diggory savagely. I thought you might, after all. She's her sister as well as my mother. Well, no matter. I'm jolly well to going ask to ask the lion himself if he can help me. And he turned and walked briskly away. Polly waited for a moment and then went after him. Here, stop, come back. The boy's gone mad, said Uncle Andrew. He followed the children at a cautious distance behind, for he didn't want to get too far away from the green rings or too near the lion. In a few minutes, Diggory came to the edge of the wood, and there he stopped. The lion was singing still, but now the song had once more changed. It was more like what we should call a tune, but it was also far wilder. It made you want to run and jump and climb. It made you want to shout. It made you want to rush at other people and either hug them or fight them. It made Diggory hot and red in the face. It had some effect on Uncle Andrew, for Diggory could hear him saying, A spirited gel, sir. It's a pity about her temper, but a damn fine woman all the same. A damn fine woman. But what the song did to the two humans was nothing compared with what it was doing to the country. Can you imagine a stretch of grassy land bubbling like water in a pot? For that is really the best description of what was happening. In all directions it was falling into, into humps. They were of very different sizes, some no bigger than molehills, some as big as wheelbarrows, two the size of cottages. And the humps moved and swelled till they burst, and the crumbled earth poured out of them, and from each hump there came out an animal. The moles came out just as you might see a mole come out in England. The dogs came out, barking the moment their heads were free, and struggling as you've seen them do when they are getting through a narrow hole in the hedge. The stags were the queerest to watch, for of course the antlers came up a long time before the rest of them, so at first Diggory thought they were trees. The frogs, who all came up near the river, went straight into it with a plop and a loud croaking. The panthers, leopards, and things of that sort sat down at once to wash the loose earth off their hind quarters and then stood up against the trees to sharpen their front claws. Showers of birds came out of the trees, butterflies fluttered, Bees got to work on the flowers as if they hadn't a second to lose, but the greatest moment of all was when the biggest hump broke like a small earthquake and came, the, and out came the sloping back, the large wise head, and the four baggy trouser legs of an elephant. And now you could hardly hear the song of the lion. There was so much calling, cooing, crowing, baying, neighing, baying, barking, lowing, bleeding, and trumpeting. Alright, there are four pictures, good gracious. So, uh, yeah, take all the time you need to look at those. Alright, we're going to continue. But though Dickory could no longer hear the lion, he could see it. It was so big and so bright that he could not take his eyes off it. The other animals did not appear to be afraid of it. Indeed, at that very moment, Dickory heard the sounds of hoofs from behind. A second later, the old cab horse trotted past him and joined the other beasts. The air had apparently suited him as well as it had suited Uncle Andrew. He no longer looked like the poor old slave he had been in London. He was picking up his feet and holding his head erect. And now, for the first time, the lion was quite silent. He was going to and fro among the animals, and every now and then he would go up to two of them, always two at a time, and touch their noses with his. He would touch two beavers among all the beavers, two leopards among all the leopards, and one stag and one deer among all the deer, and leave the rest. Some sorts of animals he passed over altogether, but the pairs which he had touched instantly left their own kind and followed him. At last he stood still, and the, all the creatures whom he had touched came and stood in a wide circle around him. The others whom he had not touched began to wander away. Their noises faded gradually into the distance. The chosen beasts who remained were now utterly silent, all with their eyes fixed intently upon the lion. 
The cat-like ones give an occasional twitch of the tail, but otherwise all were still. For the first time that day, there was complete silence, except for the noise of the running water. Diggory's heart beat wildly. He knew something very solemn was about was going to be done. He had not forgotten about his mother, He but, but he knew jolly well that, even for her, he couldn't interrupt a thing like this. The lion, whose eyes never blinked, stared at the animals as hard as if he were going to burn them up with his mere stare, and gradually a change came over them. The smaller ones, the rabbits, moles, and such like, grew a good deal larger. The very big ones, you know it's most with the elephants, grew a little smaller. Many el animals sat up on their hind legs. Most put their heads on one side as if they were trying very hard to understand. The lion opened his mouth, but no sound came from it. He was breathing out, a long, warm breath. It seemed to sway all the beasts, as the wind sways a line of trees. Far overhead from beyond the veil of blue sky which hid them, the stars sang again, a pure, cold, difficult music. Then there came a swift flash like fire, but it burnt nobody, either from the sky or from the lion itself, and every drop of blood tingled in the children's bodies, and the deepest, wildest voice they had ever heard was saying, Narnia, 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 awake, love, think, speak, be walking trees be talking beasts, be divine waters. And that is the end of the chapter. Uh, there is one more picture for you to look at, so you can go ahead and look at that. But uh, until next time, I'll see you.